that's rather an easy question to answer today when there's a bomb scare going on all around about us and the population is scared. Since this state was set up over 50 years ago, normal standards of democracy have not existed in Northern Ireland. We have had the special Powers Act and now the Emergency Provisions Act, which contravene all international human rights legislation. Um, we have an internment off and on, arrest without warrant, search without warrant, an armed police force, uh, gerrymandering, discrimination. Uh, we haven't had a democratic set up in the north of Ireland for 50 years and it's very important that we get a properly written Bill of Rights to see that we have it for the next years. Could you explain what you mean by a Bill of Rights? Well, what we would mean by a Bill of Rights is one, that there should be freedom for political expression and political belief for every citizen in Northern Ireland, irrespective of what that belief is. That uh, repressive laws should be repealed and that the paramilitary and military security forces used to uphold these laws, this must be ended that discrimination of any kind against any citizen for any reason of class, creed, religion, colour, sex or anything else uh, should be outlawed. And finally, that there should be suitable machinery so that various grievances can be remedied, proper courts so that these remedies on discrimination or that such and such a uh, repressive act uh, must be repeated. What do you think of the existing Bill of Rights which was presented by the former Rock Fenner? Well, we supported the Bill of Rights presented by Fenner Brockway and Arthur Day, but circumstances have changed uh, since that bill was first introduced to the House of Commons. And uh, we ourselves, through our legal subcommittee, have drafted a uh, Bill of Rights that meets the up-to-date conditions in Northern Ireland in 1975. Uh, we see our bill as a child and Lord Brockway's bill as the parent of what's necessary at the present moment. Do you see that one as your bill as bringing it up to date? Yes. It brings it up to date in modern conditions. What do you think a Bill of Rights would mean in practical terms for the future of Northern Ireland? Well, you see, we have very special circumstances in Northern Ireland. Ordinary, otherwise decent people have some peculiar notions. One, that uh, you can change people's political beliefs by guns and violence and bombing. And the other belief is that uh, you can be free yourself when you're prepared to close your eyes, condone and even advocate that another section of the population shouldn't enjoy the same rights as yourself. And we think that the Bill of Rights will allow political expression and the possibility for peaceful political advance for our people. And two, will knock on the head for one and all this idea that uh, internment's all right provided you or your party aren't being interned. Or that it's all right if the police beat up somebody who has a different political belief from yourself, but it's wrong when it happens to you. Uh, we think that the Bill of Rights will uh, make peaceful, normal, democratic politics possible in Northern Ireland. What support is there for a Bill of Rights? <clears throat> well, uh, the idea of a Bill of Rights is great, gaining a great deal of support in Northern Ireland. Uh, with a very wide cross-section of the population. For instance, uh, the civil liberties body that was started off by the U 
ADA uh, is supporting the idea for Bill of Rights. And I think we should switch that off and we'll see what's happening out right here. Seriously. Yeah. Oh, is that for Bill of Rights? Well, originally the Northern Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Union and NICRA uh, and several other political parties were the main people advocating a bit of rights uh, for years. But recently, particularly in recent months, the support for the idea of the Bill of Rights has grown and uh, the most widely different sections of people in Northern Ireland support the idea of the Bill of Rights, uh, including the civil liberties body uh, that was set up through the UDA, the ULAC. Uh, the problem is to hammer out an agreement on what should actually go in the Bill of Rights because we don't want a, a woolly uh, kind of a document. We want a clear positive document that will guarantee civil, political and human and social rights to all the people in Northern Ireland. And organizations who will support a Bill of Rights, I think in the next few months will be getting down to hammer out the agreements on what should go in the Bill. Thank you very much. I'm sorry.
work in relation to democratic rights and non-violence. What it would mean, for example, would be that there would be no more discrimination against people on grounds of sex or religion or political beliefs. What it would mean would be there would be no more oppressive laws, that the provisions uh, made in the Emergency Provisions Act for internment would no longer exist. That if people were going to be in prison, then they would go through the normal court procedure so they the right to trial by jury and they have the right to equality before the law, and there would be no such a thing as any internment camps, for example, in the future, if we have this Bill of Rights. Uh, and we also would see this as a way of showing to the people in the north of Ireland that it's not just for one section of the population we're asking this. It's a law that we want passed at Westminster that will ensure that everyone in the north of Ireland, Protestants and Catholics, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, whoever they are, have the right to exist here and have the basic democratic rights afforded under normal democracy. What support do you think there is for a bill of rights? Well, this is very interesting because the Civil Rights Association has been proposing this bill of rights for a long, long time now, since the early, early 70s, late 60s. And from that time, we had many people uh, saying that a bill of rights, yes, is a necessary thing. We have Brian Faulkner saying it. We have had the uh, Alliance Party coming out in favour of the Bill of Rights. We've had the SDLP coming out in favour of the Bill of Rights. We have had, right from the early 60s, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. They were, in fact, one of the first organisations to recognise the need to fight on the democracy issue, on the democratic rights issue in the North of Ireland. We will also have more auspicious gentlemen uh, in the forms of Sir Keith Joseph, for example, saying that a Bill of Rights of some sort was necessary. We have had the present Attorney General, Sam Silken, saying that such a bill is necessary. Of course, most of these gentlemen say this when they're in opposition, and when they're in government, their tunes are changed somewhat. We have Lord Lampton putting forward uh, something along the lines of the Bill of Rights and the question of democracy. We have had the Earl of Arran. And more lately, and more significantly, we have had one of the Lord Justices in the High Court in England, Lord Justice Scarman, saying that the Bill of Rights was an absolute necessity for the whole of Britain. You know, not just necessary for Northern Ireland. And why he raised that question was because he saw the British law and the British government being embarrassed to a tremendous degree by the cases which are before the European Court of Human Rights at the present moment in relation to Northern Ireland. We uh, in ICRA have cases pending at the present moment where we are alleging that the British government carried out torture on men whilst in prison. And we are having, we are hoping that the European Court will in fact come out with an indictment against Britain. And Lord Justice Scarman is obviously very worried about the situation that he sees. Uh, he has been able to see that it's not just um, an embarrassment, to, something's going to have to be done about it. And he put, puts forward and proposes that a Bill of Rights is the answer here, because if the laws in relation to democracy were codified under a Bill of Rights, there would be no uh, question of tortures arising because it would be automatically against the law. And Britain would now not be, be being hauled in front of the European Court for this matter. There's been wide-ranging support for the Bill of Rights from all sorts of quarters and groups, from every political shade and opinion in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. No. You were interned for... Okay. Uh, now, gentlemen, you've been discussing a Bill of Rights for the past eight months, I understand it. Now, why do you think that Northern Ireland needs a Bill of Rights? As citizens of the United Kingdom, we feel that a Bill of Rights is a plan of the United Kingdom as a whole, and not to Northern Ireland specifically. Um, rights, there are no funda fundamental rights in the British Constitution as such. Any rights or rather liberties that exist are really the residue of the law. And with the introduction of the uh, terrorist, Prevention of Terrorism Act 1974, in England, this clearly demonstrates that any rights that are thought to exist can easily be abrogated. So we feel that Bill of Rights must apply to the United Kingdom as a whole. Plus the fact that with the increasing involvement of the state and all, back, and all aspects of the community activity, we also believe that the time is now right for the introduction of Bill of Rights. Could you then explain what you mean by Bill of Rights? What would a Bill of Rights involve? Well, a Bill of Rights is there to ensure that certain rights, certain amiable rights that are, uh, exist for the citizen are protected at all times. But within the United Kingdom, there are no such inalienable rights under the Constitution. 
uh, events over the past number of years have shown that subsequent legislation can reduce any rights to nothing and we feel that inalienable rights must be enshrined and entrenched in a Bill of Rights. Mm. Um, now, in practical terms, what do you think the Bill of Rights would mean for Northern Ireland? Well, the US Army did say that the, uh, our opinion was that a Bill of Rights should not solely exist for Northern Ireland, but as citizens of the United Kingdom, they don't make the right to the United Kingdom. But taking into consideration the um, political backing which you find ourselves in, I don't know what form of government we may have in the future, but uh, taking into consideration that the mother of Parliament, the only Westminster, uh, would uh, abrogate certain authorities to the Northern Ireland government, which are a form of shape we may take, then we would have to say then that the mother of Ireland makes us solely for Northern Ireland. What it would mean in practical terms of that situation was to come about it would simply mean that the minority population who have maintained for some considerable period of time that they've had no rights. Uh, this I, I, I would argue about, I, I don't totally believe it, but the other people, the majority population, are as equally affected uh, in that sphere as well. That would mean then an actual fact that if the Bill of Rights was to come about in Northern Ireland, it would mean that the minority population, political or otherwise, would have to abide. If they're going to abide and want to build the civil rights, then it would have to be tied in with the Constitution. In other words, there's two points. One, this action by Westminster. Uh, unless Westminster are prepared to uphold the Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland, which means that this will in fact constrain any subsequent legislation that they would make, that they would make pertaining to the freedom of the citizen, um, then uh, if they didn't accept that, a Bill of Rights would be meaningless since we are a sub-assembly from the Mother Parliament. On the other hand, if they, do, they did accept that they would have to leave those particular rights alone and have them be upheld within Northern Ireland, then the obvious corroborative that is why not extend those to the whole of the United Kingdom. Within Northern Ireland itself, rights carry obligations, and unless all citizens who demand these rights are prepared to accept the obligations that go with them, uh, then the rights in actual fact uh, are meaningless. Again, if citizens assume that once the rights are passed, they do in fact become enforceable in law, but unless the citizen is continually vigilant, and vigilant, unless you have continual pressure groups to ensure that the rights are upheld and that the food, pr um, the food pressure of the law is applied to any abuse of them, then a bill of rights in itself is a mere placebo. Well, uh, plus the fact that uh, it would also mean that the, the courts, in actual fact, would also be a watchdog on the elected representatives of the government of the day, which were a form of government that board or shape or form that government may take. Uh, also that uh, groups such as ourselves or other civil liberties associations would also be pressure groups on the courts to keep in check any iniquitous legislation uh, which the government of the day may bring about, i.e. such as the Emerging Prisons Act or the uh, Terrorism Act that applies on the United Kingdom at this point in time. Yeah. And finally, what support do you think there is for the Well, well the support for a Bill of Rights, we believe, is in, has an inverse relationship to the whatever abuse of rights exists, i.e. if citizens' rights are being continually abused, the demand for a Bill of Rights which states specifically those, ri those, those rights in written form and to be enshrined in the Constitution will be considerably high. Uh, if the abuse of citizens is very low, then the demand for such a Bill of Rights will also be low. For example, the Prevention of Terrorism Act in uh, Great Britain is in fact applied to a very, very, very minute proportion of the population. As a result of that, there is no demand for that to be set aside. Yet, if the population as a whole were fully aware in Great Britain of the abuses that are carried out against rights that are believed to exist, uh, then you would have a tremendous outcry. 
thought as to say Westminster is a plan with only to a very minute uh, proportion of the population. But the fact still remains that that is on the statute books and can be applied to any citizen in Great Britain. So by allowing those rights to be abused uh, on the grounds that they only apply or are in fact only enforced against a very minute uh, proportion of the population, is in fact denying their own rights which, any t- which no longer exist actually under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. This is the general feeling that uh, some put it very broad terms that if a particular piece of legislation <coughs> is only affecting a very small percentage of the community, you do not have total wide support or understanding such uh, support or full support for a bill of rights to counteract the negotiations uh, mm-hmm. which exist and within that form of whatever legislation it may be. Uh, in Northern Ireland, I would say that the whole of the Emerging Commissions Act, and like this as it is, from the front cover to the back, applies to every citizen in Northern Ireland, irrespective of their political or involvement on the other scale. The ordinary citizen going to and from work has had an effect. He has felt the uh, iniquities of the Emerging Commissions Act, namely in searching his car, going to and from his place of employment. And uh, from that point of view, I think that uh, this work for the Bill of Rights. See, but the real danger is that the various political groups in Northern Ireland uh, who support a Bill of Rights are to some extent deluding the population because they are implying that if a Bill of Rights is enshrined in the Constitution, uh, it automatically follows that all the alleged evils and discrimination that exists uh, would in fact disappear. Because to say a Bill of Rights is really only the reflection of the attitude of the ordinary citizen towards its implementation. And unless he is continually vigilant, it will in fact be nothing more or less than a placebo. Uh, and this is a real danger that the political parties are in fact saying, we will support a Bill of Rights. But it's not the political parties who must enforce a Bill of Rights, it's the people. They must maintain, they must enforce and continually observe how the Bill of Rights is in fact carried out. And uh, this brings us to a very important point, uh, and that point is state of emergency. You, know, you can talk about a bill of rights, but you must always consider the occasion when an emergency arises, uh, when a group of people, for whatever reason, attempt to destroy the existing government. Now, government has a duty to enforce law and order. So whatever bill of rights, whatever is enshrined in the bill of rights, if it doesn't uh, take this particular situation into account, it becomes meaningless for the simple reason that any government will set it aside during such period of emergency. Therefore, in a bill of rights, there must be some way of ensuring that in the event of emergency situation arising, and the bill of rights being set to one side, that it contains provisions that restrict the ability of the government to do this or to maintain the state of emergency uh, for purely their own reasons and not really the interest of the state. And when I say the state, I mean the community as a whole, not just the institutions of government itself, but the citizens, every citizen. Uh, and they must maintain his rights within that. Right, thank you very much. You were interned for six months in 1958. Can you describe how you came to be interned? Well, there was some damage done around my village at Tunbridge. Yeah. And there was three, three of us taken in for questioning at five o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, by the beast specials. Yeah. How did they come to take you? Well, I didn't, they were just standing at the bottom of my bed. The key was in the door all night, and the door was most put in, and just come up and told me, to get dressed. Yeah. Took it into the local barracks and interrogated me. And what, what happened during the interrogation? Well, the uh, local sergeant and the uh, special branch they took me to Belfast. Mm. They, told, they wanted to put a charge on me and told me if I would name the names of bones who were involved, which I knew nothing about, on this certain accident happened in Tunbridge that they would uh, let me off different names to the you know, fellows who were involved with me, mm-hmm. which I knew nothing about. Yeah. And uh, he told me that he was a, 
It will be a good Catholic, this sergeant who is well up in the police force now. It will be a Catholic and uh, he'd get promotion if they could crack this case. Yeah. This is uh, supposed to be a, a very smart man. He tried to tell me that if I would tell him the names, they let me off, he'd get promotion. And uh, so on, you know, and then they told me my mother was in the mental home. And she was moved to the mental, and uh, not a lot of things. Well, well, she was moved to the mental home, he said, while you were... Yeah, well, I don't know, I guess she, she sort of went, I had never back down, and uh, he says, I was the cause of putting her there, and I'd get out, and not everything would be all right. And was your mother, in fact? No, she wasn't. I told me my sister, who was dead, and I told me that she was uh, on the verge of a never speak down too. He just sort of tried to break me, tell me lies. And yeah. How long were you kept under interrogation? I was kept for about two weeks, um, all night and all day, steady interrogation. And uh, what form did the interrogation take? Well, steady questioning, marching up and down stairs, into cell blocks, just going up and down steady, night and day. Frankly, I said 24 hours. Yeah. And then what, what happened after that? Well, they couldn't, they had no grounds for putting the charge on me, and they just turned around and interned me. And where were you interned? In Common Road Prison. Yeah. And how, what, how long were you interned? I was interned for six months. Six months? Yeah. And how were you let out? Well, uh, I got out and uh, just released out. Did you know that you, it was going to be six months? I didn't know, no, I didn't never know. Yeah. So, so you didn't know? I didn't know. I couldn't know. When you were going to? Well, yeah, of course, I was there for four or five years. And yeah. Why do you think they let you out after six months? Well, I think that uh, just the form that time, as uh, I'm sure everybody knows it, it's happened over the years, just trouble started, anybody was lifted. And if you're not a unionist, you were just sort of arrested. And mm. I was on the English, but I wasn't a, yeah. and a Republican, but I don't have. Yeah. How, how do you think they knew you were an anti-unionist? Well, uh, I reckon myself that uh, from when I was a kid, I always had a fear of the police because my name is Patrick. Yeah. You know, and uh, like this idea, if I have stopped, you know, by the police or someone giving this name here or something like that, they this fear, you know. Well, this is a sort of a republic in area, yeah. too. Yeah. And I suppose there's so many men left, and I was one of them. There's a few men around here who arrested. Yeah. And now there's 300 of them. There's, so, men, yeah. there's men in here in the 40s for six years. Nothing against them. Yeah, yeah. Can we move on now to um, 71, yeah. when you were arrested again? Could you describe the circumstances of that? Well, again, I was arrested on the 9th of August, 5 o'clock in the morning. I didn't know where I was going, taken by the army, there's about 20 or 30 of them here, took me out to the army jeep, took me to Pallet Kelly, from there to McGilligan. Kept on made McGilligan. And um, then I was taken away in the helicopter. Who did? Were you by yourself? No, there was three other fellas with me. The whole camp were shifted out to different detention centers, except four of us. Yeah. And uh, we didn't know what was happening. Just, uh, I was examined by a doctor first at the Gilligan. And, uh, of course, soldiers accused me of uh, shooting, involved in shooting at soldiers. Uh, the shooting at soldiers? Yeah. Before, before they arrested? Yeah, when they arrested yeah. you at home, didn't yeah. they? And then they accused me of this. And of course the special branch, again, that's the RUC, they asked me how many family I had in my Gilligan that morning. I told them, and they told me, they told me that I wasn't going to see them for a few years. And they asked me, was I in debt? Did I owe any money? Was I in high, no higher purchase? and different other things, and then supposed to sort of break me down. They told me that you were going to wait for a long spell. So uh, I asked them what for. And then they couldn't sort of tell me. So I said, well, I can do nothing with that. Mm -hmm. I had a special advice for them. I think maybe I knew one of their names, but it doesn't matter. 
when I saw him several times since, but he is the guy who, one of the guys who's interrogating me. And uh, I know him, I know, I know of him, and uh, I know that he's very, very few brains. He's big and strong, and he's fond of uh, plenty of beer, and that's the sort of man that was interrogating me. And, uh, and then he told me he was going away for a long time. Then that night, everybody was shipped out of the camp, except four of us. I reckon, I recognised a uh, local sergeant here, who used to be in this town, whom I know, you know, a sergeant Quinn. I called him over. I went up to the window of the hut and called him over, and he looked very surprised looking to see me. And I said to him, you're very surprised looking, tell me. He says, I am. And I says, do something about it. Well, he moved towards other RUC men, special branch men, and they all looked around and they all started to laugh. Well, I got a wee bit of fear that something told me there's something going to happen. Well, all that night there, and they kept the lights on the hut. The police, the RUC, and the soldiers threw stones on the roof. They put water in the door. The other station dogs were jumping at the hut. We kept the light burning. It's more or less to sort of, uh, I'm sure they knew what was going to happen and they're sort of trying to sort of uh, get us all in a nervous position. Mm -hmm. Well, at five o'clock in the morning, I heard a helicopter coming over and the big, this big Scots soldier, Sergeant, he was the one that accused me of shooting soldiers. He came in and he said, right, you bastards up. I'm up. And all rushed in, guns, Alsatian dogs. The handcuffed us one by one. Uh, in front of us, and marched us out. And I could see, about five o'clock in the morning, this was, I could see a helicopter in the field. And there seemed to be special branch men standing in plain clothes, six of them in a row. And then this, this fella in plain clothes, he was standing near enough with us, but he was just looking sideways at us. They just put me in mind of that. Just before you get home, you know how the way you are, like to see. And they uh, you know he's just looking at us here, and the next thing was this RUC policeman come forward and said, put these hoods on. And this hood came down to here. And the minute the hood went on my head, I lost. I just, I said, I can't breathe. And just about two hands were above me and run me over to the helicopter. I was stuck in the helicopter, handcuffed, and I was an hour and a half in there, about an hour and a half. I didn't know where I was going. Mm. And my whole fear was of her crashing, me handcuffed, and mm. Scotland was just going out. Mm. So the helicopter landed. I could hear a lorry coming forward. And the lorry seemed to reverse, and we were taking out. We were through like six of the into the back of the lorry. The terrible smell of cow's dung at the lorry. I see rumor bumps for about maybe a mile. Mm. We were pulled out, taken into this building. And I was stuck naked. And it seemed to be a doctor starting to examine me again. Nobody, nobody spoke. Mm. Then I was put and taken into this room there was a terrible noise. My fingers were put against the wall. My legs shaked apart. And that's the start of the head of treatment, which lasted, I reckon, myself for about no, I had no idea of time or nothing but it seemed to me for about three days, three nights, without nobody speaking. I was collapsing and I was falling down, I was weak, but they seemed to pick up again and put me against the wall again and hammer on the fingers back. Well, that's when the time I started to pray, I started to think different things. I thought I was in a boat, I thought I was at sea, I thought I'd to pick me through the porthole and drowned me. My mouth dried up, no water. I wasn't worried about food. I was worried about water, my tongue started to swell up. You weren't giving anything to eat, did you? Nothing, nobody spoke or nothing. Until I imagined that I had a youngster who was stayed six months old, my first youngster, and I seemed to be that the youngster, my youngster appeared to me. I thought I was dying. And I thought, in fact, I was dead. <coughs> and uh, it's the happiest moment of my life. That you were dead? That I was dead. 
some come up, some great happiness. But all of a sudden, I seemed to be pulled into a room. And then Mrs. Boyce said to my ear, had not anything to tell us? Well, I knew that I wasn't dead. Yeah. Because there's a very boogie man voice in my ear, have you anything to tell us? Yeah. And I never couldn't say nothing, I was just running about like a, the floor, like I was just crawling around. In fact, I was sort of maybe going like an animal. Yeah. I just sort of lost, I thought I was mad. Then I tried to go up the wall myself to get in the same position again. I thought I'd yeah. make some rules. And I tried to put the nails of my finger against the, the painted wall to sort of try to do this noise in my head with the noise, this noise machine that was sort of vibrating into the brain, like getting a tooth round or something. Then the shoes were slipped on me, and they seemed to mark the soles of my feet and the backs of my hands. But I never seen nothing just between this heavy marking. They tamped on my toes with their feet. Then I was taken away again on the helicopter. A long time there again. And the, scene, the door of the helicopter seemed to be open. open. And I was just sitting with an army boiler suit, which I had discovered lately, lying open all the way down. And as they took me out of the helicopter, and two people seemed to grab me, I couldn't tell you. Was, I don't know if it was. Um, the special branch men or the British Army. They kept my head down and they let me run over a broken brick. And I'm sure maybe Ron was just sort of half dragged with my head down and all of a sudden my head was banged against the wall. And I was taken to some back in the building and for the first time the hood came off my head. And I was lying across the chair and I remember I was handcuffed of course, I guess here. And I couldn't speak, and my eyes were blurred. And the way I know I was against the wall for a long time, my hands had turned a dark blue color, my whole two hands. There must have been the pressure against the wall. That's why I think that some people say I was against the wall for maybe two or three years, but with my hands, my hands worried me because the veins had all swollen. Mm. And now you see head constable sitting in front of me. He had stars on his shoulder. And there seemed to be a special branch man sitting beside him. Now, when the hood came off my head, I could see the special branch man. He seemed to be very scared of him, you know, in back like this here. Mm. And I said, why did you do this on me? He says, speak up. I just whispered, and my mouth was on. You could have put the skin on my mouth with uh, no, no water or nothing. Mm. So, he read out some detention form, which I think stated that I could be moved anywhere for interrogation. So, he said, take him away. And they seen the three boys behind me, I never saw them, and the hood was pushed on my head again. And away I went, out to the army, or police chief, I couldn't tell if you did. And then about, I mean, my, I threw in my mouth first, and I could feel a lot of a heavy two caps. I couldn't tell you if they were RUC men or army, and I was turned over. And they seemed to be about eight or ten of them started to beat me with their fists, the hood over my head, and the privates on the chest and in the kidneys. And then I was stood up because here, and one fellow just seemed to be, just had me an awful blow and say there. Well, I just passed out then. I just remember seeing a lot of bright stars, and the thing, next thing I remember was I was in the helicopter again, taken back to the same place again, the noise room. And I uh, put it up to the same place again, and up against the wall again, while well, I just collapsed again. There seemed to be a pipe running across the bottom of the wall, and you collapsed, and your face fell first against the wall, and you just fell up this pipe, and you injured your elbows. And then, Every time I done that, I tried to get up the wall again because I thought I was breaking something with no leg. It just had been trained like a, like a, like a well-trained animal. I just crawled on the floor and I was moaning and the noise and I was praying. Mm. Then I was taken in for my first interrogation by the special branch. There was a light sign and I shamed my face on the special branch and interrogated me. Well, they made me asked me different things. Every one of my friends were in the IRA around here. Every one of them. I was an IRA member. I knew other things about arms around here. 
to ask me maybe you have several rates PD GE a credit union everything names and addresses of everything even the, the several rates if you were in them uh, what, what position they held everything else then they had asked me to sing Roddy McCurley a famous uh, uh, famous uh, man who was hung the bridge of tomb they asked me to sing and I was that far and gone I couldn't sing, but I just sung the words. And then he told me to come clean then. He sent me to this noisy room again. Well, as soon as he said that, the door seemed to open. And I could hear the vibrant noise again. And I luckily broke down and cried. I said, I don't want to go there anymore. So he said, unless you come clean, tell us what want to know. And I said, I'm not the And I went again. For maybe an hour or two hours, taking it again and again. That was all for about eight different occasions. So, at the end, I really thought I was, I don't know what I thought of, uh, I never, no, I never thought I, I thought I was going to die. I thought some other more fascist government had taken over the north and they were going to execute so many people. And during the time then I heard, could hear voices moaning beside me, heavy moaning. Some boys seemed to have something, a man who wanted to die. I could hear this noise, and they seemed to be getting off and beating, I could hear something, like wooden. This, this, is in, this is in the same room. In the same room I could hear like heavy thumping, mm. and then I could hear an awful noise as if you were getting cold water poured over them. You know when you do a, 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 a cold bath here, you go, ooh, mm. and this thumping, you know. And I imagine they see that they put them into a, a cold shower and they put water in mm. And I well, got all shaky there. Next thing was, I was taking the seat wooden steps, and I thought this was my turn next to this cold shower, and I was standing waiting this thing coming. But it never come. You know, unless my mind was really gone. Mm -hmm. Waiting for this noise coming, but it never come. Then, uh, that were no different, uh, different imaginations you had, like, no. Yeah. And how long, how long before you were taken uh, into internment? Uh, it, this went on for, I say this went on for seven days, eight days I think. This went on from uh, the 9th, uh, 11th of August. That happened for uh, eight, about eight days, I think. Yeah. Um, what happened to you after the eight days? Well, uh, after that was all over. One of the special batch men who was uh, my Washington Terrier getter told me that they could find nothing on me. And what did he say about all the all the beatings and, and, and everything? Did well, I said, uh, I said, who has been here? He says, it must be your local RUC man or the sergeant. He says, do you know them? And I said, I know the sergeant. I said, but I don't know the special batch men. I have no interest in special batch men. So he said, Patty says, you're going to come and roll jail. But there's a few things you have to go through before you go. And I was stuck naked. I got into the room and I was away at the centre. He told me to wash my hands. And uh, of course the marks on my hand, I was number two. I was marked number two. Every man was under this interrogation was marked. And I was heavy chap number two on my feet and on my arms. And he gave me another scent which I suppose now I can imagine now you want to clean me up before I want to come and roll you. Mm. And uh, they give me everything, my trousers except my belt wouldn't give me my tie. Yeah. And my trousers wouldn't stay up on because after I was weighed, I, I found out I, was, I lost, uh, I think it was 16 pounds. 16 pounds? Yeah. How heavy are you normally? Uh, nice stone too. I'm uh, on the weight, weight as it is. But, yeah. uh, I knew by my arms I was, you know, and my body was all sore. This was in eight days you lost 16? Yes. And uh, they told me then I have to go through a lot of more. And I took me to this room. A doctor examined me. And uh, I saw the doctor. In fact, uh, he, was a, he, was an, he was an English man. And I uh, seemed to have a young fellow with him. A uh, heavy, holding glasses. And they took me to this room and this queer looking character took photographs of me and they did. And what did the doctor say when he examined him? Just he never spoke to us. He said a few things, but he never, of course, the special batch man was with him. And uh, <coughs> then, I was a big wash. 
just going to read out for him. And uh, I only went to the toilet once in the mid days, made my water. Once. And uh, as far as anything else, I had nothing to do. But I remember on one occasion too that I was mad to go to the toilet, I didn't want to do it in my overalls, and it just left me. And all of a sudden then, these, these voices whispered in my ear, toilet, and I said, uh, that it was right there, and they took me. And then when I went to do it, I couldn't do it, and all of a sudden the terrible pain came into me, and uh, I done my work, and I said, my terrible smell come off it, because they let, let go of my shoulders. And she took me back, and I left her squeal out of me. But to get back again, the special bass man told me that I was going to come over with you. And he told me, he says, nobody will touch you from now on. I'm going in the helicopter with you. You have to wear the hood over your head. And I'll squeeze your arm every so often to let you know that I'm with you. And that uh, your uh, torture is over. He, he used that word, did he? Yeah. You? No, I exactly don't think he used to you, but he said nobody else will touch you. But yeah. as far as from now on, he says nobody else is going to touch you. Yeah. I don't think he used to you. I said to him, where are you from? Doc, he said, you wouldn't know what I says my I'll never cross you someday. I said, I'll never forget your face. He says, what do you mean by that? Well, I says, I'll never forget it, as long as I live. So, the hood was put on my head. I was taken out, handcuffed, and put in the helicopter. And uh, he did squeeze me out. I was like a fiery, fiery touch. I was powerful, and I thought that this man, you know, like, it's maybe just because of a fear of pursuit. You know, I knew I was going to die. Mm. And I was getting to come on road jail, which I thought was a holiday camp, mm. compared to the land we were through. Mm. So uh, I landed in come road jail and uh, put in the cell. I was waiting to come on road jail too. Mm. And it just uh, corresponded the same bit as I left uh, this cell. Uh, and all, all this time, I had, what, what, what did your family think? Well, did they know where you were? Well, I landed in Common Road Jail. I had forgotten it more. I never even knew I was married. I never thought my name was blank. I forgot my wife, my family. Yeah. And all that night, I never thought I was in the cell. But just I must have made must have sort of blank or something. Until the next day, I was moved into the prison. And Michael Farr, a PD fella who knew me, he came over to me and he says, Pat Shell, what happened to you? He says, you look up. He says, your wife's looking for you everywhere. And just as he said that there, she was nice to forgot my wife. And I rushed. I said, what day is this? He told me, I think it was 18th or 19th. I rushed over to, I said, can I get in touch with anybody to phone my wife to tell her that I'm all right? So uh, I think it was Miss Kennedy, welfare officer, at one, and she said, I wanted to tell her. And she said, oh, you're the man. She said, everybody's looking. She said, well, I've been already in touch with your wife, that uh, you've been right. And she said, I've got a visit to visit you. So the next day she went to see me. And what did your wife been told one year? Well, my wife was horrified. The next day I saw her, I think she was horrified that as a new after she was 16 pounds. And uh, in fact, after she left me, I found out she fainted out in the corridor after she saw me. She collapsed. And where did she think she'd been during that day? Uh, what? Well, she rang up. Uh, when I was arrested, all the other guys, all the fellas right in this district here, had been moved to uh, Cromwell Road Jail or the Midstone. Yeah. And of course, she knew that she was expecting a letter or a charge saying that I'd been there, but she never got any. And that made me also sending charges. And she knew this wasn't uh, anywhere I go, I usually phone up or get in touch with her. But after two or three days, then, there's no word. And then she got a wee bit worried. So she rang up Cromwell Road Jail and they told her that I was in the Midstone. And I think she went up to the Midstone with a few things. And they said that no, uh, nobody that name on record. I was in Musburn and Cromwell Road Jail. And they kept her going back and forward from one place to the other. I think then she got on to a solicitor and a few clergymen and then they rang up here and there. And then I think they rang up the Minister of Home Affairs. And uh, she knew by the way they were going at the new where I was at, so she said it was a third detention place, and they said they weren't going to disclose that. And they could be. But then they wouldn't say whether you were in that place or not. They wouldn't confirm it. 
And of course, that was for eight days that I was missing that she went through hell, like, you know, because I heard afterwards that I reckon there's a special branch that put it out that made my body was cut. And the carried down coast, handcuffed, I was dead, washed up. And they told your wife then? Well, I don't, she didn't get it directly, but I was put out, and I blamed the special branch for putting it out so that they'd get to four years. And of course then, I think the civil rights rang up uh, this brother somewhere, and this very friendly soldier, Scottish soldier, come on the phone, and he said he'd help all he could, and he said, I'll give you a number to read. And it was paid his phone number, dial a prayer. That was the phone number? That was the phone number. And that was given to you by a soldier? That was given by a soldier whom uh, Marge Davidson was telling me afterwards that they think they're there in touch. So, what, what then, what, what, what happened in, in uh, Crumlin Road? Well, a couple of old jail I had, uh, I, was put, I wanted to be with somebody in the cell. Yeah. And I lost power of one of my arms, my left arm. I couldn't lift a cigarette, a cigarette dab out of my fingers, and worried me a lot, or even a cup. Of course, the doctor examined me that morning, and just a quick examination, but I was all, I seemed to be all hunched over with the pressure against the wall. When I went out, he said to me, excuse me, is your heart all right? Coming back, he said, I want to examine you. That's what I'm back to. So he examined me, but he said nothing, and away I went. Then I was put in the cell along with that, a chap from Belfast, and uh, I had clever nightmares, you know, at night, as if I was being crushed by uniforms or something. I discovered afterwards that I was standing up against the wall at night, squealing. I didn't even know, but I remember uh, in the morning I uh, woke up, I seemed to be lying there outside of the boat in the prison. But he didn't tell me, but afterwards he came out to see me here and he told me that it was nice and I was landing. I was lying and I was standing against the wall with my fingertips and I was squealing and sort of standing in that same position again and shouting. Well then uh, they gave me medicine there to sort of sat in my nerves in the prison. A psychiatrist came to see me and he put me on tablets, which I never got in the prison. I never prescribed these tablets. This medicine I seemed to be doing more harm than good. I wanted to lie all day, I couldn't sleep at night, but I still I couldn't do without it. Sort of a drug. Mm. Sort of movie certain mm. mm. And uh, then they set up the Brown Commission, which I did not appeal to. But the last support did appeal to it. Brian called me in and asked me why I had not appealed to him. The awarders took me there and, and lost, I lost, asked me why I didn't appeal to the tribunal. And why? Well, I just said that, uh, I just uh, said, I'm in there, I said, I, I just, I said, in fact, I says, uh, I'm at uh, a solicitor here, I says, I said, what have you a solicitor for? And I told Brian that I'm sure he wouldn't be interested my case, what happened to me? He says, well, he says, that's what we're here for, to help you. What happened to you? I started to tell him. Oh, well, he says, that's nothing to do with us, he says. He says, you, you refuse to go in front of a, it was a committee set up. Mm. He says, I set up and you refuse to go to get evidence there. Well, I said, I wasn't going to go in front of a company because I was an Englishman, trying Englishman, I didn't think it was a fair. So he said, well, he says, um, get this list up this evening at once, he says. Mm. She'd be very anxious. Mm. Why do you think he was anxious? Well, whether he was anxious to, I couldn't tell you, I was sick. I know I was very, very sick. Mm. How long was that after? This was, uh, well, uh, maybe a bit, month or five weeks. Yeah. And they just seemed to send for me, that maybe there was maybe 50 or 60 boys who appealed to this thing. Mm. But he sent for me. Yeah. Real, I suppose a real farce of thing too. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing, I reckon the whole rooms and everything was tapped in that place. Any man who went there because I remember that day I was in there, the phone didn't ring, but somebody seemed to lift the phone. Yeah. And uh, 
fact that we found out every man in there, the same thing happened. The same procedure happened. Yeah. 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 So, um, now you've been in turn twice. Yes. Why, why do you think you've been in turn twice? Well, because I'm uh, against the unionist uh, system. Yeah. And uh, all they wouldn't be yesterday. And, and do you think, how do you think it's affected your life? Do you think it's affected your family and your job? Well, the poor I was, was through this torture. I usually took uh, a lot of time with my children. I had, um, since that, they, they seemed to annoy me a lot. Uh, my wife, I had some terrible arguments with my wife. I don't know how much, uh, how she put up with me. But she had been telling me, you know, that more so than I've been, uh, Never happened, like to see it happen in any country. 